coming in. Coming up on three and a half minutes to air, 3.30. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Hopkins for Silence of the Lamb. Yeah, Eddie. It's the first time I've ever been backstage with all of you delightful press and uh, network people. My goodness, I I'd like to win it sometime. A little less than two minutes, everybody, to air. Diane? Yes. You really acted surprised. Yeah, well, it wasn't hard. <laughs> Thank you very much, Debbie. Well, thank you. Good seeing you again. Could you hear the round of applause that you got from that? Sure. Audience? And I felt it from my heart. I can't think fast enough, for goodness sake. <laughs> Talk to right? me tomorrow. Talk to me tomorrow. We are making the transmission switch from pre-show to main show. <laughs> I was always taught growing up that I should never expect anything. I've never expected the nomination, and I've never expected to win an Academy Award. I sort of didn't think English people could win Oscars, you know. I thought it was just for Americans. You have to understand, I'm the daughter of a man who didn't believe in competition. 30 seconds to air, remotes in black. This is my lovely daughter, Angelina. Actors? Well, I don't know, you have to ask them. What do you think, Ange? Not really. <laughs> my first Academy Award, I haven't won anything. My God, no. you know something I don't. Stand by, this counts to air. 15. Mr. Clooney, back here. Where are you? Oh, hi. Did you Mr. Clooney. That is, <laughs> see, I win an Oscar, it's Mr. Clooney. It's the vision I had of what Hollywood was like before I came to Hollywood. It's very intimidating. It's always like, oh my God, I'm a part of this. It's a room full of excitement. It's a room full of sweat. <laughs> Everybody's really... Eager. Nine, eight, seven, six. It's a huge deal. And no matter how cool everybody says they are, it's the Oscars for crying out loud. Two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host, Her Majesty, Whoopi Goldberg. Good evening, loyal subjects. I am the African queen. The first images of the Oscars I had was a black and white television set in, in Long Beach, Long Island in the 50s. Bob Hope was the host. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chance of a Lifetime. I'd have to go to sleep. Somewhere around sound effects editing, some things never change. And um, I'd get up in the morning, and in my cereal bowl before school would be a list. My mom would write a list of who won what. I was a kid. And here was the people that had already been huge, big, massive stars for 20 or 30 years. I mean, even Bob Hope had been Bob Hope for, a, you know, since 1932. I actually thought he was always going to be the host. It never occurred to me that there'd be anybody else. I just thought that was the height of sophisticated humor, was Bob Hope at the Oscars. It's a gay, handsome crowd here tonight, but there's an undercurrent of nervousness. The whole thing is like a big maternity ward. <laughs> Everybody's expecting. Oscar traditions didn't invent themselves. I see a lot of new faces, especially on the old faces. They were created and changed year after year in a process of trial and error. <laughs> wow. At the very first Oscar ceremony, no one knew what to expect. It was May 1929, and Hollywood's finest arrived for a banquet at the Roosevelt Hotel. Wings, a World War I epic, won Best Picture. There were only 12 awards that evening, 
including one for best title writing, a skill about to disappear. Change was in the air. The first sound film, The Jazz Singer, was a hit that year, but it was ineligible to qualify for best picture. Instead, it won a technical achievement award. Everyone knew it marked a turning point. From the second award ceremony on, all competing films would have sound. He's an angel of a joy. For the outstanding performance by an actress. I talked to Janet Gaynor about it, who won the Best Actress Award the very first year, and she said, well, yeah, you know, it was very exciting to get an award, but it had no tradition. And they announced the winners in advance, so they went to the banquet knowing who'd won. The next day, they kind of forgot about it. They moved on. Good morning. I'm Bob Ramey, president of the Academy. We're here to unveil our nominees for the 70th Annual Academy Awards. When the nominations are going to be announced, it's early in the morning, and the whole city is awake, tuned in to their TV or their radio to hear who's nominated. I thought, how am I going to sleep until 5.35 tomorrow morning when the announcements are made? So I went out with some friends, went to a sushi bar, and we drank a lot of sake. And I thought, this will help me sleep. And I went home. I was in bed by midnight. I woke up at 12.52, 1.37, 2.19, 2.42, 3.18, 3.20. I just got up. I just, this is ridiculous. I'm not sleeping. Turned on the TV and was listening. And, you know, and they said my name, you know, like three times. George Clooney. George Clooney. George Clooney. I just sat there in front of the TV going, I can't believe it. I saw my face on TV. Jason Reitman for Juno. There's a picture of me directing. And I realized in that moment that I had been nominated for an Academy Award. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, Inglewood area. And where I come from? Jennifer Hudson in Dreamgirls. I didn't expect to hear my name. Like, did they just say my name? I was on an Indian reservation, a Shoshone reservation in, um, I think, in Utah, when I got word that I'd been nominated. Benicio Del Toro in Traffic. You know, you get nominated and you go in that carousel, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a drug. It's like it's, it's like some painkiller. When it happened, the world explodes. You're excited. I mean, I certainly was. I never thought anything like that could ever happen. But then the crush that comes to you from everybody you know all around the world. It's your bar mitzvah times a million. <laughs> yeah. From the beginning, the Academy Awards were about more than just winning an Oscar. Two of the founding members, actors Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford, were looking toward the future. They wanted the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to promote the finest possible movies. They were people who thought they were working on a serious art form, and their main motive was to get the word out that it has earned the right to be regarded along with the other arts that have been studied for centuries. Nickelodeon viewing arcades grew into movie palaces. Actors became movie stars, a new kind of celebrity and the public couldn't get enough of them. Every day, people arrived in Hollywood with big dreams of being in the movies. All the hard work of just saying, I'm gonna stay in Los Angeles, I'm gonna do 10 auditions today, I'm gonna get rejected on 9.7 of them, I'm gonna drive home, I'm gonna get up tomorrow, and I'm gonna go to acting class, and I'm just gonna like, you know, do this little job here so I can get a little bit of money. And then one day, boom, you get a little job, then you get another little job, and suddenly you, another bigger job, and then suddenly you're like, we like what you do. for best original dramatic score are actually getting a job was it, it was years and no it was like no one wanted me no one wanted to take a chance 
I didn't even get the opportunity to do auditions. And Marvin Hamsmish for Who? The Way We Were. Who? Hamlesmish. Hamlesh. Hamlesh. Sorry about that, Marvin. People had said that, you know, that I wasn't a serious actress and that I was a crazy dresser and I dated younger men and I wasn't, and I just wasn't serious. Mike, the director, said, how would you like to be in a movie with Meryl Streep? I went, sure. You made enough noise there, darling? You two ain't exactly a silent movie yourself. And then he went, I just want to tell you, you play a lesbian, but she's an adorable lesbian. Uh, Y'all, this here's Angela. She's a beautician. Well, hi there. And then he kept going, Cher, get in there. Cher, lay on the couch. Cher, be in the kitchen. And finally, I was just kind of all the way through it. <laughs> yeah, my life, but you know, a lot of people can't handle me. I get a call saying, Steven Spielberg would like you to come to Los Angeles. And I thought, oh, okay, I I'd like to meet him. <laughs> you know, I could be in Raiders of the Lost Ark, sure. You know, it needs some black people. You know, that's how I would think. <laughs> He said, I, I'm going to do the color purple. And he said, I want you to play Celia. And I said, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I think I would be better in another part, because I've never made a movie. And he said, well, let me think about it. But I'm pretty sure that's the part I want, <laughs> I want you to do. It's like, OK. But if it's really bad, you don't be mad at me. It was always Daniel Day-Lewis, but Daniel didn't make it easy. I had actually been committed to, to play Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> and uh, Meryl was Stephen's first choice for Lincoln. None of us heard what Daniel's voice sounded like until the first day of shooting. So the minute he opened his mouth in that first scene, it, I mean, it was just, took your breath away. I am the president of the United States of America, clothed in immense power. I think with certain movies, and it's happened, I think, over the course of time, that certain movies do come into being when the right person is there to play a significant part. Why do they beg me for my photographs? Why? Because they want to see me, me, Norma Desmond. Hi there, Blash. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. It's Sunday afternoons I think of most. I feel all the time like a cat on a hot tin roof. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. How did things ever get so far? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. 